Welcome to High Cheese. It's Friday, September 27th, 2024. So let's see. What am I going to talk about today? What am I going to lead with? And uh, let's talk about the Senate released its report on the Trump assassination attempt in Butler. And look, we know that the FBI and we know that the Secret Service are going to um, drag their feet on this. They're going to slow walk everything because ultimately they don't want us to know the truth. So the Senate has uh, put their own report together, and uh, they released it this week. And let's go over some of the highlights of the incompetence that we find in the uh, Secret Service. So let's go to uh, this from the New York Post. And just a few highlights. And the first highlight is that there was a drone operator that didn't know how to operate the drone. It says here, the Secret Service agent in charge of flying a counter drone at the Butler rally ran into technical difficulties, officials found, leading him to rely on a, a toll-free tech support number for help. The agent admitted that he had less than one hour of training on how to operate a drone, with another agent giving him a brief rundown before leaving him in charge. The issue caused the deployment of the counter drone to be delayed for hours. That gap allowed the shooter, Crooks, to fly a drone on his own to survey the area without being noticed. So think about that. How incompetent can you be when your drone person has only had an hour training on the drone and then doesn't know how to fly it and has to call tech support? Next item I want to talk about. It says, special agent in charge was out of reach. During his entire time at the rally, the Secret Service special agent in charge of the Pittsburgh field office did not have a working radio on his person, the committee found. So the agent had decided to give his radio that day to the lead advance agent who flew in and was experiencing trouble with her radio. The Pittsburgh Secret Service head was on his way to get a coder from the motorcade to fix the device when the shots were fired. Then there was the issue with overall radio problems and communications. A breakdown in communication was a common theme highlighted by the committee's report, finding that the sniper team who ultimately killed Crooks failed to pick up local radio alerts about the threat. Several agents said that they failed to pick up local radios on the day of the shooting, which would have allowed them to communicate directly with the local SWAT team on the site where Crooks was. The shooter. Agents also said that their agency-issued radios were on the fritz, which they said was common for the Secret Service, which leads us to the threats. It says here the report of threats were not passed along. The Butler rally was the first time a counter-sniper unit was deployed to the campaign rallies over credible intelligence of an Iranian assassination plot targeting the former president. However, the lead agent charged with securing the Butler rally is accused of not passing along that information to the special agent in charge of the Pittsburgh field office. According to the report, that local head only learned that the counter-sniper team was going to be in place when he was asked to find housing for the agent. He told investigators that he never was made aware of the additional information about a threat against Trump. And this whole thing with communications is really deplorable. They were on different frequencies. There was no unified communication center, which under normal circumstances should have taken place. So you've got local cops, you have state troopers, you've got the Secret Service. They're all using different frequencies, different radios to communicate. But there has to be one unified location which is taking in all, these, all the information from these different frequencies and they didn't have that that is just inexcusable how do you protect the president when the law enforcement in charge cannot communicate with each other then there was no visible barriers at the trump rally the report also highlighted the secret service's failure to set up visual ba barriers around the rally site that could have blocked crooks's view on trump from the building he was on Despite being just 130 yards away from the stage, Crooks had a clear line of sight on the former president. And then it says here, 
a request for counter-assault team liaisons were denied. Trump's Secret Service detail had requested counter-assault team liaisons prior to the Butler rally, but the request was denied. Why? The agents would have coordinated with the Secret Service and local SWAT teams on the ground, which would have sped up the hunt for crooks. These requests were denied, at times without explanation, the committee said. And look, this is a bad report. And what it tells us is that it was incompetence, or maybe it was intentional. Or it could be both. Now, I think it was Eli Crane, the congressman, he had mentioned uh, earlier this week that maybe there's a mole in the Secret Service. And I blame the people at the top here. Because everything flows down from the top in the organization. If they're ambivalent about Donald Trump, or if they hate Donald Trump so much that they couldn't care less what happened to him, they'll look the other way. Let's put some comp incompetent people in Butler. Let's make sure that he doesn't get the full protection that he needs. And, and again, this is all coming from the top down. And with that said, I want to go to a clip. It's with um, Commerce Secretary Raimondo. And she's being interviewed, I think, by Mika on Morning Joe. And she lets the cat out of the bag. So let's go to this clip, and then we'll come back and discuss. How did we get here? Let's extinguish him for good. We have an answer. We have a remarkably talented candidate. And I think this was a Freudian slip here. Donald Trump has to be extinguished. And this is how these people are talking behind the scenes. I think she just let it slip out. She got a little too comfortable with Mika. She didn't realize she was talking in front of millions of people. But behind the scenes, this is how they talk. Now, Ray Mondo is the Commerce Secretary, but I'm, th I'm sure there's plenty of other heads of agencies in Washington right now that feel the same way. And under normal circumstances, I would just say, oh, this is a slip of the tongue. But there is so much hate out there for Donald Trump. You should see the hate out there in social media for Donald Trump. It's just pure hate. It's not rational. It's pure hate. And you can't tell me that these heads of agencies like Raimondo, Homeland Security, can't have this same hate. People say, oh, well, they're well-educated. They went to the right school. They came up through the ranks. They can't have that kind of hate. Oh, yes, they can. And they set the tone for their agencies. Now, there's not enough evidence to say that the head of the Secret Service at the time has that kind of hate for Donald Trump, but... You don't know. We're not privy to their private conversations with their top managers. And I know enough about bureaucracies that thoughts like that, indications like that, are going to trickle down into your organization. And did that happen at the Secret Service? We don't know. I'm not sure we'll ever know. But this is the mindset of the bureaucrats that we have in Washington under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So let's go back to this clip because Mika tries to give her some cover. And let's listen to it. And extinguish, you mean vote him out? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Vote yeah. him out. And Mika did uh, Raimondo a big favor by telling her, you didn't really mean that. You mean something else. But to me, this is a Freudian slip. She figured she was talking at some restaurant with uh, Mika. And she made the mistake of getting too comfortable. And I really do have a funny feeling that this is how they talk when they talk about Trump amongst themselves. So we shall see. This applause is not to me, really. I'm uh, everything is to you and for your work. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here with my team. And started, as I said to colleagues, started my visit to America from your city, from your plant, from Pennsylvania, and, uh... and that was Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky at a campaign stop in Pennsylvania, accompanied by Senator Bob Casey, who was acting as a Kamala Harris surrogate. 
and Casey and uh, I think the governor of Pennsylvania was there too. Um, so Casey Zelensky and the governor were at an artillery shell plant in uh, Pennsylvania. Campaign stop. War is good for the economy. Don't worry about fracking, but war is good for the economy. And this is an election interference? You have the head of another country making a campaign pitch in a swing state? Again, it's okay when they do it. It's okay when the globalists do it. And it's funny. Earlier in the week, uh, Zelensky was really didn't make some nice comments about Trump. Oh, he doesn't know what's going on, this and that. And he had no plans to meet with Trump. And Trump's position, he wants to end the war. Now, don't be fooled by all the press that you see here saying that uh, Ukraine's winning the war. They're not winning the war. And Trump wants to stop the killing. I mean, quite frankly, between the two sides, there are over a million people killed, including military. And Trump wants that to stop. And the media is just infantile with how they're trying to frame this. I think it was during the debate. They asked Donald Trump, well, don't you want Ukraine to win? And Donald Trump's response was great. He goes, no, I want the war to end. I want to stop the killing. Oh, you don't want Ukraine to win. What do they think? This is a football game? Oh, what side are you on? People are dying. And it doesn't matter who you want to win. It's the realities. This war between Ukraine and Russia is like a a flyweight fighting against the heavyweight. You may want the flyweight to win, but the heavyweight's going to win that fight. And in the process, people are getting killed. Massive amounts on both sides. And Trump wants to do the peaceful thing, the rational thing. So apparently, this week, uh, Zelensky saw the polls that have been coming out that are much favorable to Donald Trump because he called yesterday and said he wanted to meet Donald Trump. He had no intentions of meeting Donald Trump, but he had called Donald Trump and said, let's meet. And so they met this morning, I think, at the Trump Tower in New York City. But these people are becoming exposed. The Democrat Party, they're globalist. They want America run by a small elite group That includes people from other countries, quite frankly, that doesn't have your interest at heart. And before I get off the topic, uh, one thing I found really distasteful is that you had Zelensky, the governor of uh, Pennsylvania, the Democrat governor of Pennsylvania, and I think Casey, too. They all signed the artillery shells. They put their signature on some artillery shells. Artillery shells used to kill people. And that's what our leadership in the Democrat Party is all about today. It's all about war, non-ending wars. And the Biden-Harris administration announced that they're going to give Ukraine even more money. And one thing the uh, Biden-Harris administration is contemplating right now is allowing Ukraine to shoot long-range missiles, U.S. long-range missiles, deep into Russia. When hearing this, Russia responded and said that, look, this is an act of war. If you allow Ukraine to shoot missiles, U.S. missiles, deep into Russia, this is an act of war and we will respond accordingly. And when Donald Trump talks about the country being on the brink of World War III, this is what he's talking about, among other things. But they don't care. They don't care about you. They don't care about me. They care about their power. And if they have to wreck the world because they think they can survive it, they'll do it. And this is what we have to stop. So Kamala Harris did uh, a couple of interviews this week, one with Oprah and uh, another one with uh, Stephanie Rule from, uh, I think, MSNBC. They didn't go well because her answer to any question is, I was born in the middle class. Well, Kamala Harris, how are you going to fix the economy? Well, I was born in the middle class. What about the border? Well, I was born in the middle class. She's incapable of answering any question about policy because she has no policy. Just Marxist-inspired policy like price controls. 
I was born in the middle class. So apparently, she's going to take a visit this week or next week to the border. Her campaign is looking at some of these internal polls, and they're saying that things aren't going well. She's getting blamed for the border. She's getting blamed for the economy. What does the campaign do? Well, they think the American people are stupid. Oh, let's t- send her down to the border. Then we'll show the people that she cares about the border. Too late for that. Much too late for that. And then Joe Biden was on The View this week. Our lovely friends at The View. And uh, after watching some of this interview, I really question whether Biden wants Harris to win. Because during the interview, he had said he had delegated everything as commander-in-chief to Vice President Kamala Harris, including foreign policy and domestic policy. The acknowledgement is significant because it contradicts Harris's talking points. Harris has, has tried multiple times to distance herself from the Biden-Harris record. Now, if you can remember, Joe Biden donned the Donald Trump MAGA hat in Scranton about three weeks ago. So is Joe Biden bitter about the coup? Is Joe Biden bitter about being pushed out? It makes you think. It makes one think. So we shall see. Okay, I want to read an article here from the uh, Gateway Pundit. And the headline says, Outraged, Trump's supporting mom confronts and blasts school for forcing 17-year-old to register to vote Democrat without her consent, claiming Trump would doom black people. A mother in Pittsburgh is furious after her 17-year-old daughter was pulled out of class and told to register to vote without her consent. To make matters worse, the school staff allegedly pushed a blatant political agenda suggesting that if Donald Trump was elected, black people would be doomed. In a viral TikTok video, Kay Montana shared the distressing experience her daughter Nyla went through, claiming Pittsburgh Public Schools not only registered her to vote without her permission, but also was subjugated to political indoctrination. Quote, My 17-year-old daughter was pulled out of class and told she needed to register to vote. Not only was she told how to register, she was told who she should vote for. Kay said in the viral video. Why would you pull my daughter out of class and tell her who to vote for? I am her mother, and I have to have this conversation with her about upcoming elections. I have not signed any consent form allowing my daughter to register to vote at school. Nyla is currently 17 years old and will turn 18 October 5th. Miss Montana has mentioned she still has an entire month left to register to vote with her guidance. And Kay Montana and her daughter, Nyla, are African American. But this is just the example of the machine we're fighting against. They're brainwashed. They have to do whatever they can for the Democrat Party. And that's what we're fighting, this machine. And we'll win. But imagine this. You're a student, you're 17 year olds uh, sitting in school and you get called to the office. And you're sitting down and they say, oh, we want you to register to vote. And we want to tell you that Donald Trump is not good for African Americans. And, th- and then the school came out later and some type of statement said, well, we're only following laws. Oh, really? What kind of laws allows you to twist the arm of a 17-year-old kid to register and to vote for somebody? And this is indicative of also our education system. It's not about learning. It's about indoctrination. So we'll see what happens with this story. I think it has some more legs. So Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul, made a boatload of money recently in the stock market. And I want to read here, and this is from the New York Post. And it says here, Paul Pelosi has made yet another brilliant stock trade, selling shares of Visa valued between $500,000 and a million dollars less than three months before the feds hit the credit card company with antitrust charges. I guess being married to one of the most plugged-in politicians in America has its perks. Does anyone believe Pelosi is making these lucky calls entirely on his own? Look at the history. 
From 2007 to 2020, Paul raked in as much as $30.4 million from trades in Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft. Even as rumors flew that Nancy was slow-walking efforts to regulate these firms. In 2020 alone, the Pelosi's investments beat the S&P by nearly 15%. Meanwhile, the then-speaker, Nancy, stalled all efforts to toughen rules around members of Congress making stock trades and outright quashing a March 2020 bill on the issue. Uh, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, these are epitomes of the swamp, at least on a public level. There's so many people behind the scenes doing the same thing that these people are. And it's in your face. That's what bothers me. It's right in your face. And they don't care. So the mayor of New York City was indicted this week. And I can't say I'm surprised. Several months ago, he came out and he was really critical of the Biden-Harris administration about their immigration policy how it was decimating New York. And I said to myself at the time, oh my goodness, his days are numbered. And the Democrats usually don't eat themselves, but they went after the mayor here. Now, from the indictment, the, uh, it seems weak from what I've uh, read and what I've heard, but they're eating their own. And I'm not saying that uh, the mayor's not guilty, but I'm saying if he kept his mouth quiet, didn't say anything about the Biden-Harris immigration policies, he would not be indicted. I'm almost sure of that. And with that said, thank you for listening. You have a good week, and I will talk to you next Saturday.